but she's bigger still, heavy with eggs. She releases her eggs, up to 200,000 of them, and the males race to fertilize them. For the rest of the year, these carp inhabit the chill depths of the lake. But to spawn, they must seek warm shallows. Spring's rising energy is released. Over 200 carp crowd here today. The conditions created by the firing of the marsh offer an ideal site for breeding. There are only a few days a year when so many fish throng here. Sangoro, the fisherman, won't miss his chance. His methods, his 20-year-old boat, his bamboo pole, all are tried and tested. It takes years to really master the art of punting. The river courses with fresh mountain torrents, but here and there, natural springs well up from the bottom. The marsh is a maze, but to Sangoro, it's as familiar as his garden. He has some 50 traps set in various corners. Lake Beaver's spring gift. Sangoro only fishes from March to June, when the shoals retreat to the lake. He uses a simple snare of traditional materials. There's not even any bait. He just sinks a trap for the fish to swim into. His haul includes other fish as well as carp, as they all flock to spawn in the shallows. This trap is full of carp called crucians. With a single trap, he may net a dozen fish to take home. Sangoro returns, he prepares the fish for the table. The catch is usually sold or cooked for supper that evening. But today he's preparing funazushi. Funazushi is believed to be how sushi first started, perhaps a thousand years ago. 
It's salted and fermented Crucian carp and rice. It smells sour and takes a long time to make. First, salt your fish. Stand for three months. Mix with boiled rice to ferment. Leave another six months. The ingredients, rice and fish, are the key items of the Japanese diet. Sangoro's home lies about two kilometers inland from the lake shore. Water from boreholes under the village is piped into the houses. After it's been used, the water passes into a man-made stream. What could be a barren canal teems with hidden life. As spring gives way to early summer, aquatic plants reach for the sun. This one takes its name from the tree flower it resembles. The plum flower underwater buttercup. This little stickleback has no scales and can only live in the clearest of fresh water. It normally prefers cold northern currents. This is the furthest south it's found. The channel also harbors some strange looking creatures. primitive jawless fish that resemble eels. A river crab discovers just how slippery lampreys are. The channel through the village is home to creatures large and small. The water sustains people too, and in turn they use it sustainably. Each home has a built-in pool or water tank that lies partly inside, partly outside its walls. In the pool lounge friendly ornamental carp. A continuous stream of spring water is piped right into a basin, so fresh water is always available. The carp are not purely ornamental, nor are they to be eaten. People rinse out pots in the tanks and clean their freshly picked vegetables. If they simply pour the food scraps back in the water, they risk polluting the whole village supply. However, carp can scour out even the greasy or burnt pans. They do the washing up in Satoyama villages. This traditional arrangement is called the riverside method. It's used all over Japan. Cleaned up by the carp, the tank water eventually rejoins the channel. For some wildlife, the man-made creek provides an ideal place to raise young. like this variety of freshwater goby, a small fish about as long as a little finger. The villagers call it the tiny mud crawler. 
A male is busy excavating a breeding site. The even bottom supplies a perfect hidey hole. As always, the best locations are highly sought after. Here comes another male. He'd like to move in. And he's prepared to fight for it. Both do all they can to look threatening. Opening their mouths and erecting their dorsal fins to look bigger. It's a victory for the sitting tenant. There's another goby behind him. She's hanging upside down and she's laying eggs. The victory over the den gave her a place to spawn in safety. The old simple life of Satoyama communities is attracting some young Japanese back from the cities. It's June, four months after the hungry flames licked the air. Reeds that rose from the ashes now reach overhead. The marshy landscape takes on its summer look. The dense growth is almost like a jungle. A world filled with tiny lives. Each single reed stem is a microcosm. Tiny organisms called pseudoplankton live on their surface. Forests of tentacles reach out to seize organic material. Earlier, in spring, young carp hatched in the flooded fields. They stay there for about three months. The reed beds are their nurseries, where they have plenty to eat and are concealed from predatory birds. An infant fish meets a sudden end. It's been grabbed. The attacker is the larva of Japan's largest dragonfly. This aggressive ambusher hides in sand or gravel. Only its head protrudes as it lies in wait for its prey. Its correct name is the Golden Ringed Dragonfly. But to the Japanese and to Sangoro, in its adult form, it's the king of dragonflies. Chicks accompany a parent coot. 
Now is the best time to find food. An adult calls in warning. The cause? The coot's number one enemy, a weasel, egg thief and baby coot snatcher. A narrow escape. Waterfowl have to guard against foxes and snakes too. For safety, grebes make floating fortresses anchored to firmly rooted plants. An adult bird is particularly alert when the eggs are hatching. Each grebe has its own territory and each nests at the same place every year. Here comes Sangora. The birds know him already. This is his regular route. He spends two hours checking all the traps he set yesterday. His work done, Sangoro returns to the landing stage. You should see the ones that got away. Turning muddy banks into reed beds has paid dividends. He has nearly 50 fish in all of eight different types. Sangoro won't eat the smallest fish. He puts them aside. He will share his good fortune. This grey heron knows what will happen next. Sangoro finishes cleaning out his boat and another pair of eyes watches his every move. Each fishing season, this kite pays Sangoro a visit. When Sangoro leaves, the grey heron doesn't wait any longer. It's happy to clear up. Sangoro left the tiddlers for the birds. It's his way of sharing nature's riches with those around him. and they are only too pleased to take part. take the fish back to hungry chicks. Where the village houses crowd most closely together, above a garden, a lone pine towers. On a branch is a large nest. steadily under the watchful eyes of the villagers. So 
Angoro's gift is a token of the village's close ties with wildlife. It's five days since the gobies first laid eggs in the village channel. The male is still around. He's very protective, keeping predators away and taking great care of his offspring. Golden eyes peer out of the egg capsules. They're ready to break out. His father fans them, keeping them oxygenated. The newly hatched young are barely the size of a match head. Tiny as they are, they're about to embark on a journey. the current the two kilometers to Lake Biwa. There they will feed on the abundant plankton. At the same time, another new life is about to undergo a striking change. The lava of a golden ringed dragonfly. In the dark, hidden from predators, it quietly begins its metamorphosis. it will be sexually mature and ready to trigger the next generation. In the sticky heat of mid-July, villagers gather. Overgrown banks block the stream. Time to clear the water plants. Twenty families band together for their part of the channel. For the villagers, it's a welcome task their ancestors carried out for hundreds of years. 
for the fish in the creek, it's a huge nuisance. Flushed out of the shady vegetation, they seek refuge elsewhere. It's the children's big moment. With wild creatures so close, children experience nature directly. Fish and birds are an everyday part of their lives. Three months have elapsed at Sangoro's house. Sangoro's wife, Chicano, washes the fish salted in spring. Next, she will bury them in rice. Sangoro's job is the back-breaking bit. First, they lay out the fish evenly. Then they cover them. They build up several layers. The rice starch feeds microorganisms that cause fermentation. With nature's blessing, the Funazushi will be good again this year. After the clean-up, the channel runs smooth and clear. Small fry are encouraged to return. The young gobies are now the size of a fingernail, ten times as big as they were. The hatchlings from the village have spent two months feeding on Lake Beaver's planktons. They press on upstream. No obstacle deters them, not even vertical walls. Inland, the channel narrows, and ahead lies something only too keen to greet them. It's a Japanese keelback. It feeds on fish, which is unusual for terrestrial snakes.
Sauron on the keelback catches the lazy goby. Those who escape continue their travels upstream. They must avoid herons and carnivorous fish, too. The little gobies must find somewhere safe from ambushes. They bump into a row of fence posts. Inside are carp, which won't attack them. It's the channel that carries away the household's used water. Sangoro's pool offers the young Gobi sanctuary, even if he will have to do the dishes. The villagers endure the humid days of late summer with their natural neighbours. It's a drowsy afternoon. The moist air drains everyone's energy. of the spring water in the house pools remains a constant pleasure. brings welcome fresh breezes. It's time to gather rice, the staple food of the Japanese. 
As the rice dries in the autumn sun, the smell of hay spreads across the fields. With the harvest in, the time has come to give thanks. Sangoro picks two live fish from the house pool. They will survive. But tomorrow is the day the god of the rice paddy goes back to the mountains. He won't depart without being given offerings. Rice cakes, sake, white radishes and the fresh fish. Sangoro believes that the god of his rice paddy will eat before leaving. The god will return next spring when rice is sown again. Each element in nature has its own god. Every tree, rock and stream. Eight million gods of nature in all. Prayer and ritual express Sangoro's gratitude. He's almost totally self-sufficient, thanks to the gifts of nature. It's December. Winter's harshness looms. Bitter winds start to gust from the lake. Sturdy green gives way to brittle gold. Nine months have passed since the scorched earth sent out shoots. Now the reeds soar above. The slender stems will make screens and thatch. Farmers cut carefully. They don't snap or bend the long stalks. Practice has made them perfect. bundles into a tent-like shape called a round stand. The stands will be left to dry all through the winter. are visible reminders of the close connection between the farmers and the environment they have created. Winter grips the north of Lake Biwa. But even snow can't totally erase the traces of spring. In Sangoro's house, the local delicacy is finally ready. He caught the carp in his trap in spring. He and his wife salted them, and when summer came, covered them in rice to ferment. Now 
A further six months have passed. They will eat both fish and rice. Inside is more evidence of nature's bounty. The orange eggs. Sangoro invites his neighbors to share the funazushi. After half a year of maturing, the fish has the sour taste of cheese. Slow food that is endlessly satisfying. Preparation, preservation, and finally, appreciation. The precious pleasures of people living close to nature. Right next to their dining room, there is the basin full to the brim. It's cool in summer, warm in winter. The Japanese describe tight-knit relationships as being as close as water and fish, intimate and inseparable. Like the pool and its little refugee. The gobi sits in a quiet corner, waiting for spring. March finally comes round again. The reed beds have slept throughout the winter. Now the first rays of sun coax warmth into them. <laughs> 